Hello everyone and welcome to another fireside chat at the White Museum. Today we have something different for you. It is a film about Glenn Bowles, a well-known and well-loved member of the mountain community for over 60 years. As a mountaineer, photographer and artist, Glenn has created a special place for himself here in the Bow Valley. Originally from New Brunswick, Glenn came west in the mid-1950s. When he discovered the magic of mountain climbing, he was hooked, and since then he has explored the Rocky Mountains from end to end. This film is a tribute to Glenn and his love of high places. It draws heavily on an interview that I did with Glenn in 1996 and interviews that we have recently done with some of his many, many friends. So to start off, let's hear what they have to say about him. Glenn was um, the most gentle, caring, modest uh, person. Salt of the earth, genuine, stand-up guy who would give you the shirt off his back if he could and uh, just a, a real gentleman. The true gentleman in the true meaning of the, the word, uh, very gentle and very loyal and very reliable and uh, very accomplished too. Love for nature, love for life, he loved, he enjoyed life to the utmost. And he's still doing it. He was just so outgoing, quiet, didn't say too much, always looking around in the mountains, smiling most of the time. And I thought, it is, you know, my impression, my first impression was like, he's a nice guy. Glenn was always Glenn. You never got three versions of him on different times. He was just always the same steady, friendly, uh, affable fellow. The relationship with Glenn, well, probably in one word it was tense. We spent months and months and hours and hours in tents together. At the heart of the film is an interview that I recorded with Glenn in 1996 when I was working on my climbing history book pushing the limits. I was hardly near a mountain when I first came here and I didn't have money to go to the mountains so uh, I really spent most of my time around Calgary but I was working with the city and a fellow came to work with the city by the name of Heinz Cole mm -hmm. and uh, of course Heinz was a had his or he was working on his guide license at that time and uh, of course he he was a real staunch climber a real keen climber and he done quite a bit in, in uh, the Dolomites in Bavaria and Bavaria and Germany and uh, he asked me to go out. and of course I was brought up my dad was a real outdoorsman we did a lot of hunting and fishing and this sort of thing and and to go to the mountains was a real treat for me so when he asked me to go <clears throat> I was a little leery but just to be in the, I wanted a chance to get to the mountain so mm -hmm. I sure went along with him and how old were you at this uh, time? I was probably about 21 or 22. Yeah. And where did you go? What? 1957. Yeah. Well, we did the, uh, <laughs> the Grillmire route on Yamnaska. Mm-hmm. And it just about scared the heck out of me, but uh, and I didn't think I'd ever do it again, but two weeks later we were out again. So yeah. it, I really kind of got the bug just yeah. being outdoors and yeah. being in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob Gaber. I met up Bob Gaber through Heinz Kahl because they both came over about the same time from, from Germany. Yeah. And Bob was a great big strong strapper and, mm -hmm. and happy-go-lucky guy. And, and uh, he and I did look quite a bit of climbing through the yeah. mid-60s, late 60s. Yeah. Yeah. I met Glenn uh, in, Can in Banff, actually, through my friend Heinz Kahl. He came up with Glenn, and this is the first time I met him. I think it was late 57 or beginning of 50, I'm not quite sure anymore. 
from the sports side. He was athletic, he was strong, and uh, he uh, he never slipped those things. He always looked that like, I guess Heinz told him, you know, first you climb with your eyes and then with your feet and then with your hands. And he, I guess those three things, he always make sure he had a good foothold and a good, at least one handhold. And, it, you know, he, he know those things. And he was just slowly and steady. To me, I, I didn't think he was a, like a beginner. I mean, he, I, I figured he's, he's going to be a good climber sometimes. Of course, by 1960, you that, were... That was my first big year, real big year. 1960? Yeah, I think I did almost 20 peaks that year. What, yeah, what, what, uh, I what think, climbs did you do? Well, we started, uh, I think, uh, in a two-week period, we did uh, a new route on Storm, mm -hmm. Northeast Ridge. Northeast Ridge, yeah. And then the next weekend, Mount Babel. Mm -hmm. The and northeast we'll... would be the Northwest Ridge, I, I believe it was, mm -hmm. up from Moraine Lake. And we went over that night, or we were going to continue up Fay, because that ridge between Fay and Babel hadn't been climbed, but we got halfway up uh, Mount Fay, and the weather closed in, so we went back down on the Fay Glacier and went around down to the hut. Mm -hmm. And then the next day we came over and we did Bolan on the way over. Well, I think it was the next weekend, we uh, did Haddo and Aberdeen mm -hmm. by the glacier. We went around Lake Louise and climbed up through one of the notch through those needles that uh, are uh, behind Lake Louise on mm -hmm. the left hand side behind Fairview. Mm -hmm. And uh, we climbed uh, the glacier and did Haddo and Aberdeen and then we descended to the giant steps. Spent the night there, it was a beautiful evening. We didn't have much gear, we had a sleeping bag, no bivy sacks or anything, just slept out under the stars. And we did a new route on Mitre on the way back. This was all in one push? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, those over those three weekends, we uh, I think we did six weeks or something like that. Yeah. yeah. With Heinz Call, Glenn did some good climbs, including Mount Robson, the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies. In the early 60s, Glenn climbed with Brian Greenwood, one of the finest climbers in the Canadian Rockies. One of their best climbs was on the north face of Mount Edith in 1961. I met Brian actually and Al Washington and Pete Shotton and, and Pete Jenkinson through Heinz. Mm -hmm. Uh, they would all come to his house you know, in the evening and I happened to be there quite a bit. And okay. I met Brian and... Uh, and then started going out with him. Yeah, yeah. that you you did uh, that route on the north end of Edith too. That that was in September, I believe. Then yeah. Brian was having troubles. And he didn't want to use any any aid. And I kept saying, well, why don't you put a sling over the rock or do something? It won't matter if you use some aid or not. Oh yeah, but I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> so he tried it about three or four times, and then finally. He said, oh, I guess I'm going to have to use something. So he used to carry a pocket full of rocks. Mm -hmm. And I think, he, if I remember correctly, he jammed a rock and put a sling around and yeah. stepped in the sling. Yeah. yeah. But I remember in 62, uh, it was a wet year. Mm -hmm. But we did uh, the west face of the watchtower. And I, w I fell on it. I, I think I broke some ribs. Did you? But I never did have them checked. Because yeah. the rope, you know, we just used the no harnesses or anything, the right. line. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course it works loose. Mm -hmm. And when I fell it really, and then I, I actually was on a long traverse. And I had taken out a couple of pins that we used for runners. Mm -hmm. And uh, my arms, I was never very strong in the arms anyway, but uh, they were just getting weak. And I told Brian, I said, i got to go back and rest a minute. Oh, he says, I got a good anchor here, so he was actually on top. Mm. <clears throat> so I went back and I rested my arms. I thought, well, this time I'll go and I come off. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I swung across and I hit a pillar on the way and it split, split my hand a bit. And I think I broke a rib or two. Yeah. But yeah. In those days, I guess you didn't worry too much about that. <laughs> You knew everybody that climbed pretty well in those days. And uh, equipment was hard to get. Uh, there used to be a fellow named by Hector Elliott, I believe his name was, had a little place in his basement on 14th Street. 
mm -hmm. where you get stew by carabiners and ropes and the odd piton, but uh, and boots were hard to get. Hard to get good climbing boots at that time. Well, early 60s, I, Brian uh, started guiding too. And uh, of course, then I started to have to look for new partners. And through the Mountain Club, Al Cole. Glenn and I met when I would probably in about 17. Um, Glenn was oh, 10 years older than I was. And I ventured down to the Calgary Mountain Club Great trepidation, shy young t teenager, and uh, wanting to go climbing, and got uh, to go out on group trips with the uh, mountain club. And Glenn was always one of the friendly, easygoing fellows, and he just became my big brother. Ten years older than myself, experienced climber at the time. My mother and father had no idea what was going on in the mountains, never went there. And uh, one day she said to me, I don't have any idea what you do when you go away on the weekends, but I don't know how you could get into any trouble with that lovely young man that you go with. And we would hop into Glenn's white Cadillac convertible and drive down the street and honk at all the girls and whistle and hoot like a couple of silly 20-year-olds. But he was that lovely young man, to my mother. Yeah. <laughs> Another typical story of Glenn. You remember that climb we did on Old Ray Glen? Yeah, we did that in the afternoon, five and a half hours up and down. <laughs> Glenn, how do you remember all these details? But he does, he remembers every detail of every climb. How long it took, who was there, when we left. It's all cataloged. And I think most of it right in his head, still today. If I wanted to know what we did on such and such a peak, on such and such a day, um, he would, from memory, say, well, at 9.30 in the morning we were here and we had lunch at 11 on the rib over here and made the summit at 12.15. Or just amazing memory. But in 63, we uh, climbed up Alpha East Face. That was a new route with uh, my brother George and Al Cole and Glenn myself. Um, that was sort of a, the climb itself wasn't too hard. There was one little piece there, maybe 20 meters of straight ice, which, uh, you know, with the old ice axe we had in those days, it's just hanging there. But well, on the way up, it was sort of flat light. <clears throat> Couldn't see very much in the, in the snow, you know. Was, and I fell into a crevasse below in the San Nicolas. But on the way back after the climb, we had almost like uh, snowing and white out and bad weather. And Glenn said, with a grin, he was right behind me with a smile. Now, Bob, he says, don't fall into the crevasse again. And about 10 minutes later, I fell into the same crevasse on the way down. And, he, you know, we laughed. It was just two meters, just a slip because there were three guys behind me, right? I always liked the uh, look of Lougheed driving from the highway. One day, Glenn said, well, you know, nobody's traversed those, all four peaks, you know. So, is there four peaks? So, oh, yeah. So, we looked at it on the map, and I think I was interning at the time, so I was not exactly uh, out there in fit shape. Off we went anyways from the uh, Smith Dorian, and I don't remember if there was a trail, but there probably wasn't. And up and over we went, and Glenn had it all in his head. Yeah, we did it in 16 hours from the Smith Dorian down the other side into Ribbon Creek. Sharon tells me that I went over, I was dating her at the time, and she said, I was pretty bagged when I came in. <laughs> 16 hours is not a normal day for me at those times. But uh, for Glenn, it was just another routine day in the mountains. You know, Glenn uh, was uh, quite, a, quite a bit younger than my dad, something I, I never really pieced together uh, as, a, as a younger person. But, um, you know, I think Glenn had been climbing already when my dad started climbing. As you know, he started climbing at the age of 43. And um, he started with the Alpine Club, and I, that, I'm pretty sure that's where they met, was it from the, within the Alpine Club. And <clears throat> Glenn, being younger, was actually a bit of a mentor for my dad because he'd been climbing for a little bit already, but they were both still quite early in their climbing careers. 
And they developed a lifelong friendship. They were each other's best friend right from the get-go. They just had an understanding. Um, they had similar natures. They were very patient. They were, uh, th their love for the mountains was amazing and their, their friendship was, uh, like I say, lifelong. They were each other's, I would say, closest friend. You know, he loved the mountains, but what he truly loved was being with close friends in the mountains. And, uh, you know, he was a mentor, a mentor to me. Um, I can tell you a little story, for example. Uh, I remember one time we were, uh, went to climb Mount Recondite. It takes a long time to get into Mount Recondite. Uh, we didn't climb it that trip, and the weather was foul. Uh, but I was quite young, and I was, uh, by the time we got into camp, I was really tired, and the first thing we had to do the next morning was to ford the Safleur River. And I was quite nervous, because the river was in flood, and I knew I was going to go floating downstream. And I was sandwiched between Glenn and Dad on the way across the river in the morning. We battled bad weather, and on the way out, we didn't get to the top that time. On the way out, Dad was way far ahead. And Glenn stayed back with me. And he was, I was tired, I was really tired. And he just took his time, and he pointed out all the animal trails, and he said, and by the way, I can tell you exactly where your dad is because this twig is broken and that twig is broken and you can see where he went. And he just, you know, guided me and, and made sure that I made it all the way out to the river crossing. And he took my arm and made sure I didn't float downstream on the river crossing. And you know, I would have been, I don't know, not that old, 12, 13 maybe at the time. You know, those are the kind of memories I have of Glenn. Just, you know, looking out for me, looking out for others, um, enjoying all parts of the mountains. Another fellow chick that I didn't mention in the late 60s was Murray Toft. Yes, you climbed a lot with Murray. Uh, Murray's father came to me one time. I, we used to know them quite well. Yeah. yeah, Murray and his mom and dad. He says, I wonder if you'd take Murray climbing. So, I said, sure. So, so we got, uh, well, actually Murray did, and I did quite a bit together yeah. in the late 60s. Yeah. 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 This is almost a story of divine intervention. Uh, I guess the bug went into me when I was about 15, and I was coming home to share close calls and narrow escapes with my parents, and I guess they felt, uh, you know, they better do something about this budding climbing career, because they really didn't know what I was doing. And they were going to the same church as Glenn. And uh, I, I guess they felt that Glenn would be a good mentor to me. And uh, so one thing led to the other, and uh, the next thing I knew, I was in Glenn's company. Yeah. So I was very lucky to have that wing around me. At the time, I was learning a lot of rope handling with Glenn and uh, root finding skills. And, you know, judgment and decision making, you know, thinking, learning to think consequentially. The later came to the fore in me when I started my guiding apprenticeship. And of course, Glenn had climbed with Brian Greenwood together for a few years, and, and a lot of that had rubbed on. So obviously I was in, in a lifelong tutorial with Glenn in terms of mountain travel and so on. And you know, I was following in his footsteps and very lucky for me to, uh, to be able to be with such a safe and secure climber. You knew Charlie. Oh, Charlie, yeah. yeah. I, I did have the occasion to do one really good climb with Charlie, and that's the Delta Farm Glacier. That's right. Yeah. What was Charlie like in the mountain? Oh, Charlie was keen. Yeah. Especially when he was young. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and really gung-ho. And the funny part was we heard that somebody wanted to climb that. Well, Brian Greenwood and I had a look at it in 61, but we ended up doing Nepjack and Delta Farm by the other age because it's completely ice from one end to the other, bare ice, so we yeah. didn't do it. And then, uh, I think it was about 68, uh, Charlie talked to Brian, 
and told them somebody was direct from the mountain club was rumblings that they were going to climb it. So Charlie and I and uh, Brian and T and Joe Friend mm -hmm. climbed that. Yeah. That was one of the best climbs they ever did. Was it? Yeah. 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 Glenn met Elizabeth Hansma in the early 60s, and after several years of courtship, the pair were married on July 24, 1965. Theirs has been a long and happy relationship, and the pair have been dedicated to each other for over 50 years. Glenn and Liz's relationship. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> no romance quite like this one. This was uh, probably love story two after Ryan O'Neill and Allie McGraw. These two were genuine lovebirds. I worked with a gal. Her name was Kathy Fishwick. And we always went out for, for a walk. And that's how I met Glenn, actually, through Kathy and then she introduced me to Glenn and to Bob and because they played hockey together. So that to me was kind of interesting, you know. And one thing I noticed about Glenn, he was very quiet, didn't say anything. Uh, he just said, nice to meet you. And that was it. End of conversation. So then it was interesting because after Kathy and I left, I get this phone call from Glenn wanted to know if we would if I would like to go out with him and I thought gee because this is quick and he said well you know we could go to a movie we could do this or that and and I thought oh a movie sounds good and he said well he said there's a movie that's on now he said called Lawrence of Arabia so that's the one that we went to see so it wasn't until much later that we actually started dating and nothing with me went quick but both of us were both that way which was good you know that we took our time and and uh, because we went we went slowly on together for two years until he asked me to marry him but my mother she always wanted to be a journalist and she said to me I think you need to make a list of things that you want to discuss with Glenn before you get married I said, okay, so I did. And um, <laughs> my mother saw the list. I showed it to her, and she says, oh, you got some good ones there. And I said, yeah, I think so. So, of course, number one was mountain climbing. So he said, um, when we sat down to talk about it, he said, well, mountain climbing. I said, yeah, number one. He said, well, what do you think? And I said, well... I met you, you were already climbing. You've been climbing all along. I said, that's not going to change in our marriage. And you can only see his face that, whew, you know, that he was just a big wave in his mind as to what was going to come out of all this. But those two listened. She always looked out. They, they, they just fit like hand in glove. The, uh, Liz was looking out for, for Glenn, and Glenn was looking out for Liz. Glenn and Liz are a special couple, I think. Uh, Liz is a little Dutch dynamo. She's precise, she's energetic. Sometimes I would join them going to the mountains in, in, Chev's, uh, in uh, Glenn's old Chev station wagon, and I'd have the back seat, and Liz would be squashed over right next to Glenn, and he would be joking with her and singing, and he used to be able to play the mouth banjo pretty well. And he'd plunk away with his banjo and sing some wild tunes. And, and her, her nickname at the, well, probably still is between them, was Button. She was as cute as, cute as a button, and still is today. It was a pretty genuine romance, that one. It still is. I think Liz, um, over the years of her great support for Glenn and his uh, endeavors, was the basic scaffolding that kept it all together. The bedrock, I guess, to, to keep him upright and, and I think helped him accomplish what he did accomplish. You know, 
there was always she was always there when he came back from the mountains uh, um, and she was always there when he left for the mountains. Thinking about uh, Glenn and his relationship to the mountains and his relationship to the Grizzly Group and all of his other climbing friends, you know, clearly his relationship with Liz uh, was the most important of all. And, you know, Liz is an amazing person. Liz shared Glenn's love for the mountains. She absolutely loved being in the mountains with Glenn. Uh, she didn't always come on some of the more technical or challenging mountains, but, you know, she certainly enjoyed it. Um, but she supported Glenn no matter what. That was her role. She loved him, loves him so much. Um, they have one of those amazing relationships that, you know, um, survives the test of time. She would do anything for Glenn, and she, that's what she felt her role was. I don't think we have, as a woman, have a right to take that away from a man. If you want to keep a man happy and let him continue on what he's doing, if he plays hockey or he plays ball or whatever other sport, let him do it. And I think that's why we were very successful in our years of marriage because of that. Glenn Bowles is a member of what is called the Grizzly Group, a group of about half a dozen men who loved the mountains and headed into the hills together. Leon Kubernus, another member of the group, has recently written this tribute to his friend Glenn. Glenn was a good companion who never got upset or frustrated with the conditions or any incidents on our outings in the mountains. He would lead the climb or was content just to follow the group. In 35 plus years, Glenn and the Grizzly Group climbed and roamed over hundreds of peaks and hills. We skied many backcountry slopes and camped in numerous meadows in the mountains. The Grizzly Group was never out to summit every mountain. It was the enjoyment of the trip and the climb, and it was a bonus if we reached the top. Glenn liked to lollygag in the meadows whenever he had a chance. Liz joined us on some of our hiking and ski trips and always had a good time and was a welcome companion. Glenn and I both enjoyed taking black and white as well as color photos as we traveled in the hills and they provide a lasting record of all our trips together. Glenn and Liz enjoy looking at pictures of hiking, skiing, climbing and camping and thinking of the good times spent in the mountains with friends. The Grizzly Group uh, is a group of climbing buddies. And, you know, they met each other, you know, years and years and years ago uh, when they all were sort of very young in their climbing careers. And, and they started going out to the mountains and they developed this very close friendship. Now, the Grizzly Group, first of all, how does it come upon its name? They, say, they call themselves the Grizzly Group because they went into grizzly country, so the Alpine, and by the time they came home to their wives, they were all grizzled. You know, they had the several day growth of hair and uh, you know, a little bit disheveled and uh, you know, a little bit worse for wear after some of their long trips. But I think what the Grizzly Group really is, it's, it's this core group of very, very close friends. But the thing about the Grizzly Group is that they were welco welcoming. So, you know, anybody that wanted to come along on a trip, well, you were an honorary member of the Grizzly Group. Glenn always used to say, as did my dad, you know, the most important thing about traveling in the mountains was the camaraderie and the friendships that you made. And that's what the Grizzly Group was all about. I can't remember what our first climb was. It was probably something in the spring up the Kananaskis. We used to head into the Kananaskis, and at that time there was still a number of unclimbed peaks, and those were sort of our targets. After probably the first couple of years, 
we then started sitting down in the spring and we'd make a list of, of peaks and trips that we wanted to take. So we had every weekend full. Again, not everybody made every weekend, but we had an objective uh, for every weekend in the summer. I never got really involved in that because that part was Glenn. So he would, um, he would be anxious to hear like m Monday night, you know, where are we going next weekend? So um, I had to make sure I had everything washed and cleaned. And Don got Glenn started of having toasted bacon sandwiches when they were going on climbs. So I come home and he said, I took a pound of bacon out. And I said, okay. He said, can you change quickly out of your uniform and so we can, I said, sure. So here, Glenn is doing the toast, I'm doing the bacon, and then we put them all together and done. An hour later. That's how we worked it. It really worked well. We had uh, the four original guys that started it, Don Forrest, uh, Gordon Scruggs, Glenn, and myself, for some reason just hit it off. I mean, there was some energy there that just happened. And then um, Leon Coburn is next, Jim Fosty, and Walt Davis and Lynn Michaud, and they always stayed friends. They were peak baggers, these boys. They, they had some gusto, and that lasted for 10 or 15 years, where they could really make hay while the sun shone. You know, I think Glenn's quite a humble man, but the Grizzly Group allowed him to make so many ticks in the book, well over 500 summits or so. And um, what better way to do it in, within the company of like-minded, energized men that, that uh, have a great sense of camaraderie together. Well, that, that was Don Forrest's particular saying that we all adopted was that if we had to take the rope out, we were on the wrong mountain. Where, where are some of the special places that the Grizzly well, Group has gone? Oh boy, there's some great places in our mountains. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> for several years in the uh, mid and late 80s and early 90s, we've been going north of Robson. This area is, you know, the peaks aren't probably 9,500 in that order, maybe just around 10 or yeah. just under 10. Yeah. But uh, fairly good rock, a lot of a lot of quartzite through yeah. that country. But yeah. the valleys are so beautiful, meadow country, you know, yeah. lots of little lakes. We. We climbed a little peak uh, near Mount Longstaff, mm -hmm. and uh, when we were in that particular area, and we found 22 lakes, little mountain yeah. there, yeah. long yeah. Yeah. And uh, we climbed Mount Longstaff from that camp, and it hadn't been climbed since 1907, the first ascent. Mm -hmm. I remember Murray Toft uh, and I and Don went to climb Bryce. We actually did the traverse of all three peaks. Right. And, uh, we got to the Castle Guard River and holy man, it was a hot day and it was just, it was a color of coffee with lots of cream in it sort of thing, you know. And you could hear these big boulders rolling along. Murray and I said right away, oh, we'll have to wait until tomorrow morning. And Don says, no way. He said, we we'll are across it. <laughs> sure enough, we got across it. But we looked farther down, but I, I sure didn't relish the idea of getting across it. Well, we peeled off and, and Don went first. and. He found a way across, and yeah. and when we got, uh, I I just little fell before I got to the next. That's where the deepest part was, right next to the far bank. Yeah. And he grabbed me by the shoulder, uh, going down. He, yeah. Once we finally got, you know, to our second bivouac below the east peak, we went for it, and uh, I think Glenn can probably recount today how many times we had our crampons on and off that day. I think it was 18 or 20, 21 times crampons were on and off, dealing with rock and ice and so on. And it was quite a tour de force. And uh, it was like, uh, you know, walking through the throne room of the gods up there on the, on the knife edge of, of Bryce, looking over on Alberta on one side and King Edward and all these huge peaks of the ice fields. And there we were right in the middle of it all. It was an amazing day. 
So Glenn was a pretty strong, steady mountaineer? Incredibly steady. And I, I, never, I never once saw Glenn get really excited about anything and, and act too fast. He was very, very methodical about decision making. And uh, I don't know if it was an obvious leadership technique, but uh, he used to use that rhetorical question in a, in a situation. Well, what do you think we should do now? <laughs> so he was able to pull suggestions out from the group and, and then we'd kind of discuss it and, and with his senior uh, mileage, we'd make a decision on things, you know. Probably the thing that I love the best is Glenn's cooking, his camp cooking. You know, you'd have the Optima stove to cook on uh, and it might have been storming or whatever the case might be. And most of the guys and myself uh, brought pretty decent food, but Glenn just exceeded all of us. His favorite was craft dinner. And every time we went on a trip, somebody would say to Glenn, what did you bring for dinner, Glenn? And he'd proudly say, craft dinner. I think Glenn has so many friends because he loves people and when you love people like that I think people tend to love you too. You know it's a very maritime-ish way you know they, you live in a small tight-knit community you accept people for what they are and you're not judgmental and uh, you're, you have to be friends with everybody you can't have enemies in a small village. My impression what I had in the beginning I figured this guy, you know, is such a such a nice guy, and the, he couldn't help being a, having so many friends. The, you know, he just threw him towards him, not through what he did, but through his demeanor, the way he was, the way he looked out, the way, you know, he if if you if you were resting on the way down somewhere and eating a sandwich on the, on the rocks and he, and. He always made sure that you had a nicer place that than him or, you know, some things like that, little things like this. But they were uh, what makes, that what makes Glenn. If I would have been in a tough spot, Glenn was one of those guys I would have liked to be on my rope. You know, some of the best times we had was after coming off a summit and you stop in the high alpine and you're in the flowers and maybe beside a babbling brook or whatever. It's probably the closest most of us will get to heaven. When the Grizzly Group went out on their climbs, all of them loved to take photos. And uh, photography was a big part of of uh, being in the mountains. So it was taking photos of mountains, but taking photos of flowers, plants, um, each other, you know, portraits and that kind of thing. They were all into photography. I think the difference is that Glenn just took it to that extra level. And his photographs were a notch above. They really were. Was he always a photographer as well? Always. That became more evident when he was climbing and he carried two cameras, one black and white, one color. So that became his passion, more in, I would say, early and later years. I think the photography allowed him to share these amazing experiences he'd had uh, from early on. Right through his life, he seemed to be very interested in teaching others, sharing his experiences, sharing his knowledge. Uh, not just keeping it to himself. We did some climbs sometimes, and I said, Glenn, I got a, a good stand here. Would you like to take some pictures? Oh, yeah. He would not actually, during the climb, say, Can you stop? I'm going to take a picture. He was very, unless it was easy. A lot of times I know he, uh, what he actually looking for, but he was looking for everything. I think he had an eye for, uh, for a good photograph and uh, he had his camera always at the ready, it was always around his neck, and uh, he could pop off a photograph quickly and never slow anybody down. 
But he also used his photography to help in his artwork. And when you see these two mediums together, they're amazing. They both speak to the detail. And you can see how Glenn experienced the mountains through his photography and through his artwork. Uh, besides mountain landscapes, he's got quite the portfolio of animal figureheads as well. He's got one of a grizzly and a, and a wolf that are just amazing. And uh, I just really see the painstaking nature uh, that Glenn has had in, in creating these beautiful pieces of art. There's a real gentle style there that I think is a, a great reminder for the younger generation that seems to be focused on um, technical success and using mountains for as a playground or as a gymnasium to do your, your personal best in. And I think that needs to be counterbalanced with, with the romantic history of, of why we go to mountains originally. To be humbled, to, to feel the power of mountains. And I think uh, Glenn has captured that really well in, in his artwork and black and white and color photographs. In 2006, a coffee table book containing some of the best of Glenn's drawings and photographs was published by Rocky Mountain Books. This book is a testament to Glenn's great skill and artistry and his love of the mountains. It was Kiwi, Fran, and Bill Hanlon were after him constantly. They wanted him to do his book. They said he has so much you know, like all his photographs and his art. And F I think Fran and Kiwi finally said, Glenn, you have to do it. Glenn needs time to think about things. So he said he would let them know. And that's what he did. And when he saw the finished copy? Oh, he just looked at it. He said, wow. I said, yeah, that's all your work. Now it's in print. And I said, you didn't want to do it. He said, I'm glad I did it. In 1967, to celebrate Canada's centennial, the Alpine Club of Canada organized a mammoth expedition to the St. Elias Mountains in the Yukon Territory of Northern Canada. The expedition was composed of three different parts and Glenn was involved in one of these. A climb of Good Neighbor Peak located on the border between Canada and Alaska by a team of four Canadians and four Americans from Alaska. 50 years later, to celebrate what was called the Yukon Alpine Centennial Expedition, Glenn Crawford and I made a film about the expedition. The first peak to be attempted was to be called Good Neighbor Peak. At an elevation of 4,785 meters, it sits on the Canada-Alaska border and forms the south peak of Mount Vancouver. The unclimbed peak was considered one of the hardest chosen for the entire Centennial Expedition. Four Canadians and four Americans comprised the eight-member team. Yeah, I was selected for in the first phase of the climb, which was Good Neighbor Peak. In Good Neighbor Peak, we could see the, the Pacific. It was right on the U.S.-Canadian boundary. The high elevation and the close proximity to the storms coming off the Pacific Ocean made Good Neighbor Peak a serious endeavor. The two teams of four made good progress in the early stages, putting in their Camp 3 at 4,270 meters. With the weather holding, the climbers set out from the high camp on the fourth day. They're really enjoyable because it was fairly high peak and the conditions were not too bad. And we could also see Alverson, Kennedy, and uh, 
and she cooked and Mount Logan from the summit. We all got to the summit and then uh, several of the guys went all the way over to the unnamed peak between Vancouver and Good Neighbor. And then two got from Good Neighbor Peak all the way to Mount Vancouver, which is the third peak in the line. With the teams safely back in base camp, the first stage of the Yukon Centennial Expedition was a resounding success. Now I look back, but at the time, I probably thought, man, oh me, oh, that gave me a point in my memory where I did something that I really probably got a name for, and it was success on a fairly big mountain. Glenn is a much loved and respected member of the community of Cochrane where he lives. And recently, a trail alongside the Bow River at the west end of town was named to honor him. The Glenn Balzer's Trail, well, how that came about was through a lady at the church. She said to me one day, why isn't there a mountain named after Glenn. And I said, gee, because I said we'd run out of mountains, because everybody should have a mountain. You know, that's how I responded. And she says, you know, I'm going to do something about that. And I said, well, whatever you think. I left it with her. And she phoned the minister of recreation in Edmonton. He gave her some ideas. I think you need to do something in your own town. So she got started on it. And she finally decided to go to council and get the council bring it forward. So she did. She brought it forward and it would be a decision that the council had to make with the mayor. And um, that's what happened. It just one night at one of the council meetings, they, she phoned me up and she said, well, Glenn's going to get his own trail. And uh, that's how that happened. It's a 1.4 kilometer trail uh, leading west from Cochrane and to me it's very symbolic too, it, it speaks a lot. I think their choice was very good for the town of Cochrane as well because it goes along the Bow River, it heads west and it heads into his playground really and I think just aesthetically, symbolically it'll always be there then so it lends that passageway is still there to the mountains and, and drawing us all to the mountains. Uh, and a, a, you know, a, a route that he's traveled so much over the years himself when he had any opportunities to go to the mountains. I think his journey to the mountains in itself is very, um, Poignant to me, that's a great legacy to learn from. Is that whatever our origins are, we can we can certainly you know follow our dreams and and achieve a lot of them if we're kind of diligent enough and pay attention and put the work in to achieve them. In the mountain community, I think he, uh, he's he's a legend to start with. I mean, his legacy is not just. He climbed all those mountains and some first ascents, but also the way he was, the way he helped out in the rescue. He was he helped out in the rescue. He was a, a ski patrol. He was a, a ski friend. Uh, he was just all around in the mountain. He was well known. In this mountain community of ours, the legacy of Glenn is uh, is definitely going to last with. It not for this man that did heroic, amazing climbing, but for this, this man that just loved the mountains and devoted his life to them, and they have definitely been his uh, life, yeah, along with Liz. All he wanted to do was climb. That was in his heart. And, and I could see that more and more as as the time went on in the years, that that's what he wanted to do. He loved the mountains and he loved the people that he traveled through the mountains with. He gave so much to others. He was a mentor, he 
cared about people, he cared about the mountains, and he was a true mountaineer. I think that's his legacy.